It's kind of like a story my daughter would write. <laughs> I thought about borrowing one of her stories for that, but. And by the way, I just want you to know, it took me about 10 times writing that before I achieved anything close to what I was trying to do. I already knew what I was going to write. I had it typed out on the computer, and it took me 10 times to copy it out before it finally worked, because I made too many mistakes. How many of you can read it? You understand what it says? Okay. All right. How many of you may have found a place that it might say one thing and it might say another? You weren't positive. Okay. I have never done this or seen it done. This was kind of a, let's find out what happens, because I have no idea how it's going to turn out. So I was just kind of curious. Looks like everybody's getting real close to finishing, right? right. Has Aubrey figured it out yet? Well, let's open with a word of prayer, and we will get into it. Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you for allowing us to uh, come and, and learn some things about your word and your truth. I pray you'd give us clarity, give us understanding. And Father, I pray that you would guide in all that we do this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I just want you to look at what you have. You may have the whole thing finished. You may not. I want you to look and, and think... How many of you think you might have made a mistake somewhere in there? Maybe you put the wrong letter down, you spelled the word wrong. Few, few mistakes scattered about. Okay, just ask you about a couple places in particular. Right here. Did anybody fix that to make it what it probably should be? How many of you fixed it? Okay, a couple of you fixed it. What would you fix it to? So you added an I in there after the A. Did you do the same thing? Okay, so a couple of you fixed it. How many of you left it the way it was? Okay, I'm just curious, why'd you leave it? Did you leave it because you're just trying to copy it, or did you leave it because you didn't know, so you just left it? I'm just copying exactly what's there, okay? That's good. What about, um, let's see here. Right, what's that? Didn't even say interpret. Didn't even say interpret, exactly. What about this right here? How many of you wrote a U there? Okay, how many of you wrote an O there? How many of you didn't know what you should write there? Okay, we see a little bit of both. Um, how many of you have something else that you would say, I made a mistake somewhere and you would admit it? Who would admit to a mistake? Keith? Lift out the L after plan, okay? You caught it, but... You made the mistake in copying it, okay? Anybody else? This is a little piece of fragment. This is 146 characters long. Out of these 146 characters, we have, I don't know, anybody have any idea? How many people do we have in here right now? I'll just say 50. Do we have 50 people? Something like that. Out of 50 people, once again, how many of you would say you probably made a mistake or you know you made at least one mistake? Hold your hands up for a minute. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I know you did because you didn't copy exactly what was there. So there's 14, 15, 16. Okay, so far we've got 16, 17. Okay, so we've got 17 people that say you made at least one mistake. Now, you might have made more than that, right? So you might have made a few mistakes. So all I'm trying to show you is this. You just copied out by hand 146 letters, and you made a mistake. Now, do you suppose that if you had to do that about for the next three hours, how many mistakes do you think you'd make? Think you'd make more of them? 
What if you handed what you had just written to somebody else and said, would you copy that for me? Do you think they would have made mistakes based on what they copied from you? I would imagine they would. And if you spread that out a little bit, you'd probably have some more mistakes. Now, how many of those mistakes would be bad mistakes? For example, those that changed the P-L-A-N and you added an I there and you changed what was written there, was that an improvement on that copy? Well, you spelled it right, so you used a judgment to spell it right. But what if that wasn't intended? What if there really is a word plan or plan and it means something different and you just didn't know the word? I'm playing devil's advocate here. Does everybody see where I'm going with this? Okay, now let's suppose that we took all of your copies that you all made mistakes on and then we did the same thing. We let somebody else copy them and copied and copied and copied and then we brought all of them together. Do you suppose that by examining all those copies of copies of copies and we brought them all together, even though there are mistakes in probably every one of them somewhere, do you suppose that we could take all of those together and by examining them all together, could we come up with this? We could, and the chances are extremely great that we could come up with exactly that, those words, exactly. Now, that's a really, really simplistic explanation. All I want to do is kind of give you something to think about as we go into the discussion, just to start your minds thinking about what a huge task it was when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, and somebody else said, you know, I want to be able to take that back to my church. And he didn't have a photocopy machine. And so he had to get out his pen and papyri and write it out just like you just did, only it took a lot longer. So that's where we're going, and I will set that aside for now, but just uh, keep that all in mind as we move on. So we're dealing with the history and the reliability of the New Testament text. We have to start with a few presuppositions. God is. Would anybody dispute that? I hope not. We know that God is, and we also know that because God is, God has revealed himself. The scriptures make that plain. We can look outside, we can see God has revealed himself in creation, but most importantly, God has revealed himself in his word. Now, we know that to be true based on what we read in his word. We know he can be known. We know that he's given us his word. We know it's truth, not only by what we read in the scripture, but we can also see the testimony of saints that have gone on before us. We can see the change in the lives of those around us that God has worked through his word. And so there are many ways that we as believers know that God has revealed himself and that we can know his word. However, this whole truth is attacked today. The world wants us to believe that we cannot know God, that the word of God is not authoritative, and so they're going to do some things to cause us to change our minds about its authority. So with that in mind, there are some things that I think that every believer needs to begin to understand about how we got the Bible, about how God preserved it for us, because certainly he did. God has revealed himself in his word, but we need to understand how that came about because the problem is that false understandings of that will lead you to one of two extremes. And we really don't want to be on the extreme ends. We want to be where God has spoken. And so I believe that's what we're all about and that's what our focus is going to be as we go into it. So I just want to give you to start off with a few definitions of just some basic terms that I'm going to use that I want to throw out there I'm using the slide presentation not because I really like slides, but because I want it to make it easier. If you want to take notes, we'll try to cover a lot of information. And uh, so as we cover it, feel free to take notes that you can check up and study it and look at it later on. But a few definitions. Number one is manuscript. Sometimes you'll see the word MS for manuscript or MSS for manuscripts. By manuscripts, all we're talking about is a fragment of or an entire handwritten copy of some or all of the Word of God. Now, we can talk about manuscripts of all sorts of ancient Greek literature. We're dealing with today, we're talking about manuscripts of the Scripture. So this might be as small as a little tiny fragment that has a few words on it that are words of Scripture. It might be an entire book. And we have a few of those from antiquity, but they're all referred to as manuscripts. 
extant manuscript. The word extant simply means it still exists. So if you hear that or read it, an extant manuscript is one that exists. A codex is an ancient book. Books began to come in common use probably around the year 90. Um, it's supposed that probably the biblical authors may have originally written most of their material in scrolls. Scrolls were in really common use um, previously. All of the Old Testament had been written on scrolls. But during the mid to late part of the first century, people began writing in books. A number of reasons for that. Scrolls, you would write on one side of the scroll, not the other. Well, paper was expensive. It was very difficult to produce. So a book was a way to use both sides of the sheet. That was a huge advantage. Also, the idea that a scroll, can you imagine how difficult it is to find your place in a scroll? Jesus took up the scroll of the book Isaiah and found his place and began to read. Well, if you've got a big scroll, how are you going to find your place? You better be really, really familiar with that scroll. Codexes, books, are a little bit easier to page through and find your spot. So it began to get real popular. Interesting thing is that books began to be popularized by Christians. This is probably one of very few things that Christians were at the technological forefront in was in the development of books because of the great love for the Bible and the desire for it to be available. So codices are pretty important. Codices is the plural of codex. We have uh, textual families or text types. We're not going to get a lot into this today, but the idea of a textual family is trying to discern based on the way the particular text reads what its lineage is. You know, for example, we have several family groups here, and family groups tend to share characteristics. You may not look exactly like, but you might have a similar nose, or your ears might be shaped the same, or your whole family might be tall, or your whole family might be short. Well, ancient texts carried on similar characteristics. The way certain things were written, uh, perhaps a change that occurred in one text, not in another, and it's plain to see if there's a change that happens and then somebody copies that text, it's pretty plain that those are in the same general family. And so you'll see this idea of textual families or text types happen a lot. There are three primary text types of the New Testament. Um, you don't have to write it down or memorize it, but the Alexandrian text type, the Western text type, and the Byzantine text type. And we'll talk a little more about those later on, maybe next week. Probably won't get to it this week very much. But also text and by putting the word text here, all we're talking about is typically a text is a compilation of a textual family and compiling them into one text where they try to determine what is the reading of the entire thing. So a text or a, uh, a, an addition of a text is simply a bunch of texts they put together and try to figure out which is the reading that should belong and putting it all together. Uh, when we have a modern translation, our King James translation, is a text. That is, they took a bunch of different manuscripts and discerned a textual family, and then there were even some differences in those, and they had to determine which is the reading that we want to put in the text. And so that's the importance of that. Textual variants are simply changes in text, such as adding an I after A. That's a textual variant. It's something changed. It might be good, might be bad, might be something you can't even see. It might be something that changes the meaning. It might not be, but textual variant. Finally, the word textual criticism. And this is where everybody gets a little afraid because I don't want to criticize the Bible. Take it in its normal, proper English meaning as it was intended originally. Criticism is not a bad thing all the time. Criticism is simply applying discernment to what you're studying. There are a number of forms of criticism that have abounded during the time of the, the scriptural text. There is what's known as higher criticism. Higher criticism is the determining who wrote and when did they write each book. Nothing wrong with that per se, except that higher criticism tends to begin to deny that God inspired the Bible. That is, an example of higher criticism would be the critics that try to say Peter didn't write 2 Peter, somebody in the second century did. Or somebody says, well, John is too, uh, John is too doctrinal. 
And John has too developed a Christology. That didn't exist in the time of Christ, so that must have been written in 200. Well, that would be a higher critic, and we'll deal with some of that, and textual criticism blows some of that out of the water, and we'll get there. But higher criticism tends to be more destructive. There's an element of it that's reasonable. You know, how are we going to determine that Paul wrote what Paul wrote? Well, some of that is involved. But there's also lower criticism, which is referred to as textual criticism, which is simply the art and the science of determining what was the original reading of the New Testament. Textual criticism is taking all those copies that you all wrote and bringing them together and trying to see, okay, there was this mistake and this mistake. Which one is the real thing? Well, based on this and this and this, it looks like this was the real thing. That's textual criticism. Trying to determine what was the original writing. That's pretty important, I think, when it comes to the scripture. Would you agree? I want to know what God said. So every one of us, whether we realize it or not, every believer is involved in some way in textual criticism. Most believers simply leave it in somebody else's hands. This is the English translation I'm going to use, therefore that must be what it is, and they leave it in the hands of those translators. That may be fine, that may be perfectly acceptable, but you're still exercising some form of textual criticism and that you're saying, I'm going to let somebody make that decision for me. So I think it's important for us to get an idea of some of these things that we can begin thinking. Understand this is a huge, huge discussion. Just for this presentation today that we're not going to get through the entire thing, and this will be a couple weeks, I think. But uh, just for this presentation today, I can't tell you how many hours I put into it. This has been a topic, the first book that I read that dealt with textual criticism was about 15 years ago. Since then, I've probably read 40 or 50 books and hundreds or thousands of pages on the internet and other papers and other things. This is a huge subject. It's overwhelming. And I want to make it clear that it's overwhelming because when you say, I didn't quite get that, write it down, think on it, keep studying, don't be afraid of it because it's something that takes a lot of study. The Bible instructs us, study to show thyself approved unto God. There is diligence that's required. If you say, well, that's just too difficult, it's over my head, I'm just a simple Christian, I can't understand that. Well, let me ask you, how difficult is the Trinity to understand? Does that mean we need to stop studying it? How difficult is the doctrine of the sovereignty of God and how that works with suffering and with sin and with chaos and with tornadoes? How difficult is that to understand? Does that mean we say, well, I can't understand it, so I'm not going to study it? No. Now, I understand not everybody is going to go to the, the amount of study that I have in this particular topic. And I'm not saying you have to. I'm simply saying that we need to begin to understand some things concerning this issue. So moving along, let's talk for just a minute about the Old Testament text. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. This isn't really the burden. The Old Testament text is pretty solid as far as there is some variant in the Old Testament text. However, the way that it was copied and worked out was pretty amazing. The text that we use today is pretty much based on manuscripts from the 9th and 10th century. It's amazing that uh, before 1948, that was pretty much the earliest manuscript evidence we had of the Old Testament was in the 9th and 10th century, as far as direct copies of the Old Testament. Now, keep in mind, the Old Testament was completed about 400 years before the time of Christ. And the reason for that was the great preservation of the text by Jewish copyists. They were extremely careful in the way that they copied it. The Masoretes arose about 500 AD. The Masoretes were a group of, of Jewish preservationists, as it were, that desired the purity of the Old Testament text, and they had some very extreme rules about how it was to be copied. If they came, for example, to the name of God, they would have to stop, bathe, use a fresh pen to write that name, and then they would stop, redo the whole process. Amazing. They had the columns were counted. Every character was counted. 
I told you there were 146 characters in the, the, the little manuscript fragment that I displayed to you in the beginning. Every line had 11 characters. Did anybody bother to count that? I didn't tell you had to, and you didn't. But that's one way that they made sure that there weren't mistakes because there had to be exactly the number of letters and the characters and the number of lines and so on. So they were very exacting in the way that they did it. Uh, so the Jewish scribes would, would count. They wanted perfection. We also have the Old Testament early quotations in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, in the Targum, in the Latin Vulgate, in the LXX is the uh, abbreviation for the Septuagint. It's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So we have a lot of evidence that goes back before the Hebrew manuscripts that we have that has been able to be, to be verified. One of the greatest things about the Old Testament text, there was a lot of scholars in the past century that were saying, we can't know the Old Testament text any more than we can the New Testament. It's not the work of God, and so on and so forth, until... 1948, perhaps you've heard the story late in the year of probably a, a young goat herder that was exploring the caves around the Dead Sea. As the story goes, he threw a pebble. And the sound wasn't what he would have expected, so he went to examine and discovered an entire cave system filled with manuscripts and fragments of manuscripts. Among these were manuscript copies of the Old Testament that dated to before the time of Christ. And the amazing thing was that up till that time, the earliest manuscripts we had of the Old Testament were from 9th, 10th century. They examined these manuscripts that were from a thousand years before. There were variants, but it was remarkably similar. It was plain that the text had been preserved. And so there were a number of questions that scholars had had about the Old Testament that suddenly here was manuscript evidence that it was exactly as God had intended it for it to be. We have confidence we have the text of the Old Testament. And so that's not really our, our focus so much, but I just wanted you to be aware of some issues regarding the Old Testament. It's uh, the study of Old Testament textual criticism is quite a bit different from the New Testament. I haven't done nearly as much study into that, and uh, it's another, another uh, level entirely. One other thing that I want to talk about before we get into the text is the canonicity of the New Testament. Canon comes from, it's the Greek word for measure or rule. So canonicity is determining which books belong in the Bible. Now, the Old Testament was pretty obvious. Jesus and the apostles all make witness to the law, the prophets, and the writings. The law is the first five books. The prophets compose of the former and the latter prophets, of which are included the Samuels, the Kings, uh, the major prophets, and the minor prophets, which they called the Twelve, that were all combined. And then the writings, which include Chronicles, which includes the books of poetry, which includes uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and so on. So the, the apostles, Jesus, all the Jews testified the Old Testament canon was set before the time of Christ. It was plain. This is God's word. The New Testament was a little bit different. The Old Testament, there was one people, the Jews. They had a central location, the temple. They had scribes that were tr specifically trained and prepared to copy and to understand and to teach the Old Testament. But when we get to the New Testament, suddenly we learn that we have no priests because every believer is, we are a kingdom of priests as Revelation describes us. We are in holy priesthood. And suddenly we come to a place where there is no central location. You think at first, well, Jerusalem will be the central church. But that doesn't happen because later on we find that Jerusalem's poor. Where are the first missionaries sent out? Not from Jerusalem per se. It's Saul sent out from Antioch. And so the gospel begins to spread throughout the world. Churches begin spreading up throughout the world. And so this idea of what is scripture becomes a little bit more difficult. Now, I will say to begin with, the Roman Catholic Church did not give us the canon of scripture. You will hear that. Uh, primarily, it's unbelieving scholars that are trying to denigrate the text of the New Testament. This was not something that came about because the Pope said these are the books of the Bible. 
it was long before that. There was a council, there were a couple councils that said this is the canon, but the canon of scripture had already been determined. Those simply made it plain what they were. The scriptures were collected over time by the people of God. Paul would write a writing and it was plain. Every church that received the writings of Paul, it was treasured. The writings of Paul that we have, most of them never had any question whatsoever about whether they were canon or not. The, uh, the Gospels, same thing. There was never any question. There were some questions. There were a few books that you can still find, the book of 1 Clement, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas, just a couple of examples of books that when you read them, they carry some truth. Uh, they do carry some encouragement, some inspiration in the faith. Uh, however... As time went on, it became plain that they weren't scripture. They may have been good writings. They may have contained truth, but maybe not completed truth. Uh, there were some of the books that uh, didn't, weren't, everybody wasn't in agreement in the beginning. There were some books there were questions about. Second Peter was one that wasn't sure. James wasn't sure in the beginning. Hebrews, uh, Jude, second and third John, Revelation. Now, you can imagine Revelation, and I'm glad that Revelation was not instantly accepted. You know, all the churches saying, oh, goody, here's a book about a seven-headed beast and a, and a dragon. And, yep, that's got to be in, making light of it, I understand. But they were cautious. They wanted to make sure, is this the word of God, before they would finally come to that. What was the standard? Well, basically, the standard boils down to the witness of the Holy Spirit. And it's plain to see through history how God's spirit worked in the hearts of his people that all these things came about. Apostolic authority was a major standard. If an apostle wrote it or if it was an associate of an apostle, that made it more likely that it was actually scripture. Uh, antiquity, was it old? That is, second century Christians would not accept second century documents as scripture it was required to be something that was in the first century during the time shortly following the, uh, the death and the work of Christ. Orthodoxy, that is, does it teach correct doctrine? Some of the other books that I mentioned, the Shepherd of Hermas, First Clement, and so on, their doctrine is not all in agreement with the doctrine that everybody knew was plain, the, the, the epistles of Paul and so forth. So if there was something in a particular letter or book that didn't line up with the rest of what was known to be scripture, they would eventually cast it out and recognize it's not uh, the word of God. Finally, Catholicity. Now, don't get scared at this word either. This does not mean the Roman Catholic Church. This simply means universal. That is, it was accepted by all. That is, you couldn't have one church that would say, well, the epistle of Barnabas is scripture. And then the other church, would, well, I guess if you said it is, we have to accept it. No, they would all have to accept it. And if most of the churches said, no, we're just not sure about that, then eventually it would get rejected, and it did. So by the, there are documents that some of the early church fathers, early writers have written in the late second century, in the third century, that have included most or all of the books of the New Testament and nothing else. Now, there are some of the codices that are early fourth century, third century that seem as though they may include some of the other books, but that was still when it, everything was still kind of in flux. But by the time of the, the great councils, um, the Council of Hippo, the Council of Carthage. Uh, by the time of these councils, everybody recognized these are the books that are part of the Word of God. And so there really wasn't a lot of question by that time. So what we have today is not what the Roman Catholic Church decided this is the Bible. It is what God's people from the first century on determined as they were reading, as they were studying. You can pick up some of these other apocryphal New Testament books. Uh, the Shepherd of Hermas, for example, there, it's, there are some good things in it. But one of the things that you find is that when you read some of these books, being familiar with what we have as scripture, there is a tone, there is a note that is different. You may not be able to put your finger on it, but you say there's just something that's not quite the same as Paul's letters. It's just not quite the same as what Peter said. And you recognize there's something about that. And I believe the witness of the Spirit is certainly plays a huge role in that, that God made it clear what is his word. So let's talk about what the modern attacks are. Information right now is readily available. 
I brought an illustration. Everybody sees this stack here. These are all mine. This isn't my family's, you know, my kids that I've thrown on the stack. This is everything that was in my office. I have here about 45 different Bibles. I have represented 32, I believe, English translations, about seven or eight different languages, Greek and Hebrew and German and Japanese and Spanish and so on. There's a lot of information right there. You know, 500 years ago, we could not have had this conversation. I, pr I have more Bibles than some people I know have books in their house. And I would imagine most of you, you might not have that big of a stack, but most of you have a stack. How many of you have more than two Bibles that you own personally? Yeah, just about everybody. We have such a huge amount of information because of the age we live in. By the way, that means we are so much more responsible. Can you imagine, instead of being able to go to Mardell and buy, well, this is actually an 1887 print of the New Testament. Somebody gave it to me. But even in 1887, it was pretty easy to buy a copy of the scripture. And it was available to anybody. And even then, it wasn't that expensive. But can you imagine at a time when everybody had to do, if you were going to have a copy of Matthew, you would have to take it and not just write a few lines on a piece of paper. You'd have to write all 28 chapters of Matthew for yourself. Quite a bit different time we live in. And so it's obvious that attacks are going to abound. Attacks are distributed quickly. Someone once said that uh, error is halfway around the world before truth wakes up in the morning. And sometimes that's the case because it spread so rapidly. Uh, and so the enemy is working. We have a lot of work to do regarding this, this truth. You know, if we were to advertise that we were going to talk about, we discovered who the beast is. And we were to advertise that on the radio and the newspaper, can you imagine? We wouldn't be able to keep them out. But if we were to advertise, we were talking about the text of the New Testament, now, I know we have many people here that love the word of God and want to know about it, but what about everybody else? They wouldn't be here nearly as rapidly. And so these attacks are primarily against the New Testament itself, not so much against the Old Testament. There are things against the Old Testament, but it's mainly focused on the new. These attacks are attacks from modern naturalistic materialism. That is the idea that Anything that does not presuppose an uncreated universe. Is that confusing? Anything that does not recognize that there was nothing until God made it something. And the world says, if that's what you believe, then we don't want any part of it. And so if we believe that God revealed himself through his word, that's going to be attacked in the world in which we live. And so our, our claims are going to be relegated to myth. Anything that we believe about the scripture, it's just a story. And so the world looks for champions. Well, it's found one, and I'm going to give you the guy's name just because I want you to be aware that he's out there. He's been on NPR. He's been on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. He's been on various programs. Bart Ehrman is one of the champions of modern attacks against the scripture. He is such an insidious character because Bart Ehrman is an excellent, top-rate scholar. He is very good at what he does. He's written a number of books that are written very well. And most of his books mostly contain fact. But the problem is that his purpose is he, he claims to have been raised in an evangelical home. Um, he was raised an Episcopalian, so I don't know that I'd exactly call him an evangelical. However, when he went to college and started learning about some of the things that we will see about the New Testament, he said this couldn't be true. If God didn't do a better job than this, which God did an excellent job, and we'll see that. But he said, well, if God couldn't have done a better job than this, then there's no way that this could be the word of God. And so he basically set about to, in his study of the New Testament, destroy the faiths of as many Christians as he could. And he would deny that particular statement, but it's clear that that's what he's at work doing. And uh, he's written a number of books. Uh, he wrote uh, Forged, a book that denies basically a lot of the apostolic writings of the New Testament. He wrote a book called Misquoting Jesus, where his main point is we can't know what Jesus actually said. <laughs> 
And it's funny because if you read the book, you discover that he actually doesn't make that case very well. It's more of a sensational title because he wants people to read it. And uh, so he's one of the main attacks and his primary attack, as well as that of all the, the agnostics against the scriptures is we can't possibly know what John, Paul, Peter, Jesus actually said. You say, well, we might be able to come close in some places, but we just can't know. Now, I don't know about you, but that would concern me if we couldn't know. And what Ehrman will tell you is, we don't have the original manuscripts. That's true, we don't. He'll say, we don't even have copies of the original manuscripts. That's true. He'll say, we don't have copies of copies of the original writings of Paul. That's true. He emphasize all we have are copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. And that's basically true. So how do we know that what we have is scripture? Well, there are a number of ways that, that um, scribes can make errors. And we're going to skip this. We're going to come to this later for the sake of time. I want to talk about variants. We'll talk about scribal errors later, but let's go to variants. How many variants are there in the New Testament? Anybody want to venture a guess that hasn't read extensively on this subject? Anybody want to guess? How many variants do you think we have in the manuscripts of the New Testament? Somebody give me a number. Nobody's going to... A variant, something that's different, as in there's a spelling error or there's a word different, or maybe one, one manuscript does not contain this verse and this one does. 98,000. That's a lot. Anybody else have a number? 400,000? What? He's right. Now, that's, that's sort of a, a, a guess figure because there's so much information, there is no way to know for sure exactly how many variants there are. But a rough estimate is 400,000. Now, to make that a little bit more, um, a little bit more real to us, there are only 138,162 words in the New Testament. That's one particular edition. You know, that, that varies depending on which edition you're looking at. So what that means is that we have more variants than we have words in the New Testament. Now, Bart Ehrman will tell you that, and he's absolutely right, and it sounds really, really scary. To put it graphically, it looks about like this. There's words on the top, and there's the variants on the bottom. That means that for every word in the New Testament, we would have to assume that there are about three variants for every word. Now, I'm not trying to destroy your faith. Okay, we're going to fix all this. <laughs> but it looks like a really big number. Now, the reasons for this we'll, we'll go into, but think about the truth and what the truth about that is. Those numbers are correct. And you can see how that anybody that does not believe could take those numbers and say, see, you can't know what God's word says. Because that means that when I read uh, hell in the Bible, it might say heaven. If there are three variants for every word, right? Well, it's not quite that simple. The truth is that 99% of all variants are not meaningful. And that skipped ahead on me. That is, they are not something that could be translated. For example, they are something that's misspelled. All they show is that scribes could not spell any better than our kids can spell. They're spelling errors. That it was obvious that it was an error. Plan versus plan. Plain, right? Spelling errors. They were things that um, could not be translated. For example, when we put an N after A, if we're going to say an octopus or a dog. Well, what about the word hour? Do you put a hour or an hour? Or what about, uh, you know, there, there are lots of other words like that, that it could be either one. There are variants like that, 99%. They're either spelling errors, they're an error in a word that can't be translated and it doesn't change the meaning at all. 99%. So that's 390, or, uh, not 399,000, what was the number? I forget. Uh, 396,000 
of all those variants are things that you wouldn't even know what they are. So that's good. <clears throat> and over half of the meaningful variants, that is variants that actually change the meaning of a word, only half of those are actually viable, which means they could possibly be the word. There are just some things that it's obvious. Yeah, it changes the meaning of the word, but it's obvious that's not really the way it is. So when we put these numbers on the screen, let's see what that looks like. There are the number of words, and there are the number of variants that are meaningful and viable. Suddenly, we're reduced to about 1,500 to 2,000 variants that actually change the meaning of a word and that are actually possibly the words that the original writer used. Now, I know you still hear that 2,000 number, and it's still maybe a little bothersome, but does that change it just a little bit to understand that it's not as bad as they are trying to make it out to be? So are there some variants that, that change some things? Yes, and we'll, we'll get into some of those. Not going to do that quite yet, but what I want you to understand is that we have the original words of the New Testament. A few ways that we can see that. There are 5,000, almost 780 cataloged manuscripts. Now, this is everything from a little three and a half by two and a half fragment of papyrus to entire thousand page books and containing the entire Bible. Uh, and this is ranging from the, the second century all the way up to, we've even got fragments of manuscripts from the, uh, from the 18th century. Most of them go up to about the 16th century when printing began to come into play. It changed the character of copying and no longer did you have to copy by hand. And so there are all these manuscripts, average of 200 pages per manuscript, per fragment. And so there's a lot of information. Out of all these, there are 1.3 million pages of handwritten text. Now, when you have 5,780 manuscripts, let's say that every one of them spells one word wrong, and they all spell it a little bit differently. How many variants does that make? 5,780. You see how this number of 400,000 variants can really grow to look like something that it's not because every, every manuscript that you have, every time there's one little tiny thing, it suddenly grows and becomes much more. In other words, the fact that we have 5,780 manuscripts means that we have a lot of testimony to what it actually said. The more manuscripts we have, the more variants there are going to be because we don't have printed copies that every copy of this edition is going to look exactly the same. They didn't have that, which means that no two manuscripts are exactly alike, which means there are going to be variants. But the more we have, yes, the more variants, but also the more we have, the more surety we have that we can look at it and say, okay, this is obviously what Paul intended to say. So with all these, all these averages, now all these, there are a couple different types of manuscripts. There are papyri, which are, I will talk about that in a minute. Uh, there are majuscule or unsealed manuscripts that are later manuscripts that I'll explain what those are in a minute. And we have the minuscules that are the later manuscripts. Now all of them, about 94% of the manuscripts that we have are after the ninth century. What we're working on today mostly is looking at the manuscripts that were the earlier ones. So we're looking at a very small number of manuscripts, but we do have plenty from those early days. Of the papyri, that is, they didn't have paper like we have it today, and animal skin that made parchment or vellum was very expensive because of the number of animals you'd have to kill to get enough, enough uh, skin to make paper. So they would take the papyri, the papyrus plant, they would flatten it out, and there was a process by which they would flatten it out, and they would interleave all the leaves of the papyrus, some going horizontal, some going vertical. I just got that backwards. And uh, they'd push them together, they'd smash them, lots of pressure, let it dry, and it would all stick together, and it would become a form of paper that you'll see a couple pictures of it here in just a minute. We have about 128 catalog papyri. Most of these are very old. They're not new things at all. They range from the 2nd to the 8th century. After the 8th century, we really didn't have any more papyri. 
Most of them, this is important, most of them were discovered in the 20th century. And I'll show you why that's important here. I have a picture here of P-52. P-52 is a little tiny fragment from John 18, and you really can't see it real well. Let me see if I can uh, point out one or two uh, little things of note here on P-52. Uh, the papyrus are all numbered by the first one to discover, be discovered was P1. Second one to be cataloged was P2, and so on, all the way through. We've got all the way up through P128. So those numbers don't necessarily mean, they don't tell you anything about what date it is or so on. It just tells you this is the number in which it was cataloged. And so P52, um, if you look right, uh, <clears throat> let's see here, right here, those little characters right there is the word martyr. Anybody know what martyr means? Witness. This is from John 18 where Jesus is standing before Pilate saying, for this cause was I born, which is all up here, for this cause to bear witness of the truth is over here. An amazing little copy of manuscript. Why this is important, if you went to seminary in Germany in, say, 1870, the Tübingen University came up, one of the professors there came up with a synthesis of some ideas. He said the gospel that Paul presents is very Gentile in nature. The gospel that Peter presents is very Jewish in nature. And he said there's no way that these two work together. They can't both be true. And the early Christians in his mind, he said they all understood that, and so they took the two ideas, the Jewish gospel and the, and the Gentile gospel, and they synthesized them, and when they did, they came up with a high view of Christ and a developed Christology, and therefore somebody wrote the gospel of John, but this professor's idea was it could not he said, John absolutely could not have been written before 160 AD. And he said it was probably written about 170 AD. Now that was taught for about 90 years in German scholarship, which Germany was sort of the hotbed of scholarship and that kind of spread. Well, what do you think that does to the gospel of John? If the gospel of John was number one, not written by the apostle John, and number two, it wasn't written till late in the second century, what does that tell us about John? It's probably not scripture, right? If that's the case. I love how God works. 90 years later in 1934, a man was digging through some fragments of papyrus and manuscript in the John Rylands Library, and he found this little piece. Now, it looks real big up here. This is about the size of a credit card. It's displayed right now in the, uh, the uh, library in Dublin, Ireland. Just a little tiny fragment. And as he looked at it, he said, wait a minute, I recognize those words. And he realized this was from the Gospel of John. And so he thought, I wonder what the dating is of this. So he sent this fragment to four, or he photographed it, sent photographs to four different paleographers. A paleographer is someone who their profession is to date ancient manuscripts. Primary way they use to date them is by handwriting. They've got some other clues as well, the types of material used, the type of ink, and so on. But he sent it to four guys that were all recognized experts in dating uh, papyri fragments. Every one of them came back and said, this fragment could not be any later than 150, probably earlier than that, possibly as early as 100. It's dated right now, scholars say it's probably about 125. One of the paleographers, one of the four, actually said, no, it's probably not uh, second century, it's probably actually around 90. Now, if you know anything about John, you know that there are some that think that John may have written his gospel around 90, a fairly late date. Others believe it was an earlier date. I'm not going to dispute which one it was, but there was one paleographer that said this might even be from 90. And if not, it's from about 125. Now, do the math. What does that do? That puts us how close to John's writing? Just decades. Now, you remember what the professor in Tübingen said? 
John could not have been written before 160. And then God says, no, wait a minute, I'm going to let you know what truth is and allowed this little fragment to be discovered that proved that John absolutely had to have been written before 160. Well, how did that prove it? Well, it's kind of hard to write something that was written before it was written. It's kind of hard to copy it. So it was made very plain through a a manuscript like this. This is probably, it is the earliest fragment of manuscript that we know of. Now, there are other fragments that have not yet been cataloged that they don't know what they are. Um, There's one that uh, Dan Wallace has said that there is a fragment that's been discovered of Mark that some have dated to the first century. Only problem is Dan Wallace hasn't actually published it yet. He said that about two and a half years ago, and I've been following it, trying to find it, and he's kind of shut up about it. And uh, the last I heard a couple months ago, he told somebody, I can't say anything because I'm still under non-disclosure on it, but the book's coming, just wait. So I'm, I'm really eager to see. I'm hoping that it really is a manuscript of Mark from the first century because that would be amazing attestation of Mark. But P52, a really important, not so much for the text because there are only a few words. You can't really read a lot of it. Now, the amazing thing is I didn't have time to do this, but they have actually been able to reconstruct based on these words. We know what would have been here. And the end of the book is right about here. That's the end of the page. So we know what would have been written here. We know how it would have looked all the way throughout. Both of these are both different um, sides. This is the back side of it. This is the front side of the Gospel of John. You can see the the text, the verses that are written there. An amazing manuscript that God allowed uh, to be found. Here's another one, P72. Uh, P72 was uh, discovered in the last century. Uh, Most of these papyrus there had been ideas about what the text was before the papyrus was discovered. When the papyri were discovered, it kind of said, we can see, it's very plain what the scriptures say because all these ideas about what we have and what it looks like it says, now we're getting validated by manuscripts that are very early. P72 dates from about the latter part of the second century, uh, maybe even up to early third century. Uh, This was discovered, by the way, before Constantine, or it was written before Constantine. Why is that important? The critics of Christianity will tell you that the deity of Christ was not taught before Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. Well, this is a manuscript from uh, 1st and 2nd Peter. This right here is the second epistle of Peter, as you can see if you can read Greek right there. By the way, um, these are as hard for someone who can read Greek to read as they are for you just about, because the way that these are written, this is not modern Greek handwriting and font. It's difficult. I can, I can read this picking through it really slowly if I have my Greek New Testament beside me to, I can't quite make out what that letter is, and, and I can do that. This is something that it actually takes specialized training to be able to read these for the most part. But right in here, we've got a couple things here that I just wanted to point out. If you'll notice right there, you see there are sets of two, two, uh, two groups of characters with a line across the top. This is what's known as the nomina sacra, Latin for sacred name. Because papyrus was so expensive, writing materials were so expensive, and because they wanted to emphasize where God is in the Bible, the early Christians would often abbreviate names of deity, Christ, Jesus, Lord, Savior, and so on. They would abbreviate these words. Typically, it was by using the first and the last letter of the word with a line across it. And in some cases, as you can see here, there are two words here. This is the abbreviation for Jesus Christ, Yesu Christo. And so we find the nomina sacra recognizing Jesus is God. First Peter or second Peter here is telling us our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So well before the Council of Nicaea, it was recognized by the people of God that Jesus is God. By the way, look at the handwriting here. And we'll see some nice handwriting in a minute, but you notice how it almost looks like he might have been in a little bit of a hurry. Notice how there are some places where, like right here, the spacing isn't exactly uniform. You know, the, the, the words kind of go up and down, and some of these letters, they kind of, they're, they're a little bit rushed and squeezed together and so on. You can see over here, some of these, 
these things aren't exactly professionally done. Understand that especially in the early days, it was a capital offense to own, much less copy, a portion of scripture in most of the world. So here is someone that read these epistles of Peter and Jude and said, that's God's word. I need a copy of that in my church. Now, I'm, I'm supposing a little bit. I don't know exactly. We don't know anything about the guy that wrote this. But it's clear he had a love for God. He had a love for God's word. He had a love for the people of God. And he desired to have God's word with him. He cared about it. You know, you think about it. We have enough trouble getting people to come to church faithfully. But here's somebody that literally risked his life to write these words that we now have as testimony that God's word has endured. Now, would there be differences between the the things written in this fragment and what we have today? Uh, There are some differences, but you know what? If you read it, there actually aren't as many as the unbelieving scholars would have us believe. If you read P72 and if we simply took it and made an exact translation of exactly what P72 says, you would be able to look at that and say, yes, those are the words of Peter. God gave his word in the second century and he kept it so that we still have his word today. Another important manuscript, P75. This is another late second century manuscript. It's a copy of Luke and John. It's interesting that this one right here, right here, this is the end of Luke and the beginning of John. And so it has the words, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. By the way, this is another one that is... uh, late second century, but it is tied with Luke. You remember the guy that said, wow, it's getting late. The guy that said John couldn't have been written before 160. Well, this is after 160. However, it's tied with Luke, which even then they recognized was much earlier. And so very clear, here's someone that is saying John is just as valuable to us as Luke. Because of time, and I don't want to jump way ahead. We're going to continue this. Um, There's a lot of information here, but here's the one thing that I want you to realize from what we've seen so far. We're not talking about variants yet. We'll, We'll get to some of that. What I want you to see is that God has made it clear that we have his word. God has given us his word infallibly, We can know that when we read it, we have the words of God. We can know that God has revealed himself to us. It does not mean that there will not be problems. There are going to be problems. There will be things that we have to study that we don't quite understand, but God has made it clear, I have given you my word. It's your job to study it, to know it, to obey it, to grow. These are the scriptures that Paul said are breathed out by God and they are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or woman of God or child of God may be thoroughly furnished to every good work. We have God's word. We'll continue it, but we'll stop there and enjoy our snack. Yes. Yes. No, no. You could take all the variants, and I don't care which variant you said, I think this is probably the variant. There are variants, and there are some that change the meaning. There are none that change doctrine, which is amazing. And so it all tells 5,780 manuscripts that we have to say, yes, we have the word of God. You are dismissed.